You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, teacher, mom, and chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today is January 23rd, 2022, and this is episode 157 of Lighthearted. Our main guest today is a former lighthouse keeper in England, Neil Hargreaves. And a little later, we'll be launching a new feature we're calling Be a Lighthouse. Lighthouses are seen everywhere as a symbol of hope. That's the basis for our new feature. I'm really looking forward to it. We'll explain that in a few minutes. I'm really looking forward to it as well. I'm, I'm excited to see all of the amazing guests that we're going to get for this part of the podcast. Likewise. Uh, so as I said, this is January 23rd. Has anything interesting happened on this date in Lighthouse history, Michelle? Yes, it has, Jeremy. On January 23rd, 1905, Ram Island Lunch Lighthouse in Maine went into service. It's about a mile offshore from Portland Head Light, and the 90-foot tall granite tower is nearly a twin of Graves Light in Boston Harbor. The first stones were laid for the lighthouse in July 1903, and it took a year and a half to complete. The keepers lived inside the tower until it was automated in 1959. You know, I had one of my most memorable lighthouse visits ever in February 2006. It's hard to believe it's that long ago, but I visited Ram Island Ledge Light with a Coast Guard Ace and Navigation Team, and with my good friend Bob Trapani, Jr., who's been on this podcast a few times, including last week. Uh, I'll never forget jumping from the bow of the boat as it was bobbing up and down onto the, the rocks by the lighthouse, and then climbing up the 30-foot ladder up the side of the tower up to the doorway. It's, uh, you know, visits like that to those isolated offshore lighthouses that I always remember the most. That sounds like it might have been pretty memorable. It sure was. <laughs> also, on January 23rd, 1737, the American statesman John Hancock was born in Braintree, Massachusetts. When he signed the Declaration of Independence with a flourish, he said, and I quote, There, His Majesty can now read my name without glasses, and he can double the reward on my head, end quote. Huh. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's the most famous signature in American history, for sure. So let's tell everyone about our first guest today, Neil Hargreaves. Sure, Jeremy. Neil Hargreaves was a lightkeeper for Trinity House in England from 1974 to 1988, and he is the founder and chairman of the Association of Lighthouse Keepers. Neil, who was originally from Lancashire, spent the first two years of his lightkeeping career on light vessels, mostly the Newark lightship off the Norfolk coast in southwest England. After a six-week training course at Trinity House's Blackwell Depot on the River Thames, Neil became a supernumerary keeper and received further on-the-job training at various lighthouses on the coasts of England and Wales. After only three months, he advanced to the position of assistant keeper. Neil's first appointment as an assistant keeper was at the Smalls Lighthouse, a wave-swept granite tower on a rock about 20 miles off the coast of Pembrokeshire. After two years at the small station, he spent seven years on the inner dowsing tower, a converted coal rig in the North Sea off England's East Coast. Neil's final three years working for Trinity House were spent traveling around to various light stations in England, Wales, and the Channel Islands. He spent time at Longships, Souter, Wolf Rock, and several other stations. His last station as a keeper was Portland Bill on the Dorset Coast. Neil founded the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, or ALK, in 1988, and he serves as its chairman. The ALK manages a lighthouse museum on the south coast of England. The group runs lighthouse tours and produces a quarterly journal called LAMP. You can read more about it at alk.org.uk. I recorded this interview with Neil using Zoom back in April. Unfortunately, it was not the greatest connection. The audio wasn't very good. We were not able to redo the interview, and after an attempt at editing it, I kind of put it on a back burner. I recently went back to editing it and I worked to improve the sound quality as much as I could. I had to edit out some parts that were completely unintelligible, but I salvaged most of it. And the version you're about to hear is almost a half hour long. Some of it is still a little difficult to understand. So I transcribed the entire thing. You can read the transcript on the USLHS news blog 
at news.uslhs.org. You might want to follow along with the transcript as you listen. So here's my conversation with Neil Hargreaves. I'm speaking today with Neil Hargreaves, who is a former lighthouse keeper in England and also the founder of the Association of Lighthouse Keepers. You know, I was reading some interviews with you lately, and uh, in one of the interviews, you talked about how you worked on fishing trawlers before you became a lighthouse keeper. I'm sure that was an interesting job that could probably be pretty scary at times. Yeah, it was a dangerous job. Uh, I sailed out of Fleetwood, and then I ended up on deep sea, uh, the Faroes in Iceland. That was a beautiful sight to see when I first saw Iceland, see these white mountains rising sheer out of the sea with the pink tints on the top. Absolutely magical. But unfortunately, we weren't allowed to land at the time because it was during the term of the Cod Wars with Iceland. We had the Icelandic gunboats trying to cut our, our nets away. But there must have been some uh, heavy seas you encountered at times. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, there were one trip. We, we ended up sailing right the way around Iceland. We, the skipper kept sailing uh, north and right down the top to escape the weather. But uh, the weather was that bad. Uh, there was one, one sea. The vessel actually keeled over and half the boat deck was underwater but wow. uh, it was pretty close I think that one I only did it for two years before I transferred over to lighthouses you uh you worked in the light ships at first but uh, what what exactly led you to, to work for Trinity House was being a, a lighthouse keeper or, or uh, being a light ship sailor were, were those uh, things you aspired to uh, before that I, I can't say it was to be honest Jeremy it, some guys I knew who having a drink with them in the bar knew they worked for Trinity House and they got talking and they, they told me they were, they were looking for the guys on the light ships. That's, that's how it came about. After being on the trawlers like that, I imagine uh, being on the light ships was a fairly calm uh, way of life, but it must have had its interesting moments. What, what was life like on the light ships for you? It was less dangerous, I must admit. But having said that, the light ships in the UK, they can't move under their own stream. The ships out there for three years, we, our ships were month on, month off. But they take them in after every three years for dry dock and repair. North Sea's only a shallow sea. So when the wind's whipped up, we, it could be quite choppy. If you got wind and tide in a certain way, the, the light ship could behave like in a corkscrew, corkscrew motion. Oof. So luckily, I was never ever seasick, not either on the trawlers or, or on the light ships. But it... It was a different experience to lighthouses because on a light ship, during fog, you watch out on deck because you had to listen out for the fog signal when it blasted. If the mm -hmm. vessel was close by and the rebound would come back to you and you could sort of suss out how far away that vessel was. And if it was too close, you'd have to call everybody out in case it was going to hit you. Small coasters used to come along. The, yeah. the vessel I was on, the newer, it did end up getting hit twice. Luckily, that was after I'd left. <laughs> so after a couple of years in the light ships and then after your training course, you became a supernumerary keeper. Uh, that's not a term we use uh, here in the, the U.S. From what I gather, it was kind of like being an apprentice keeper. So can you explain a little bit about that? What did you do as a supernumerary keeper? Yeah, that, that's correct. It was going around various lighthouses to begin with before you got a specific posting still learning different engines because they had different engines at different stations, different lights at different stations. I even got to, to go on an old IOB light at St. Mary's, the old incandescent oil burner. That was something in itself. It was, wow, you know, yeah. It was like being back in time, you know. The very first light I got sent to was Suter Point uh, on the northeast coast. And the second one was St. Mary's Island. That was a great little island. Uh, it was connected by a causeway, which was covered at high water. One of the keepers on there, he had a couple of canoes, so we got used to go out sea canoes. That was great. Hmm. But uh, yeah, on, for after there, I went to St. Anne's Lighthouse and then Cromer. Uh, but it wasn't long before I actually got posted into Smalls because of the time spent on the light ships previous. After your time as a supernumerary keeper, you were... Uh, an assistant at the Smalls Lighthouse, which is yeah. extremely remote. It's the most remote station operated by Trinity House, I believe. It's That's about correct. 20 miles off the coast of Wales. Uh, life there must have been really interesting. 
you were certainly felt like you was at one with nature sort of thing being out there you know you just had the sound of the sea and the seagulls it, uh, it was quite something did you enjoy it i did i did to begin with i did <laughs> mm-hmm. to begin with <laughs> yeah 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 for the most part the, the guys were a great set of blogs great camaraderie in the job you know mm-hmm. but there was just one particular chap on this station he didn't he wasn't there when i first went there he came later and he was just a complete racist a bigot homophobic you name it he was it <laughs> you know yeah. and you even watch tv without some derogatory comment coming in so I, those I just had enough eventually, and I wrote into Trinity House saying, look, you need to get me off here. They did. They gave me a transfer to the Inner Dowsy. But there's an end story to this, Jeremy. After I did seven years on the Inner Dowsy, the last three years, they put me on the pool, which meant I got sent there and relieving people who were off sick or on holiday, a month here, a month there. So I got to see a lot more light agents than what I would have done normally. And one of the superintendents phoned me up one time and said, look, we'd, we'd like you to go to Suter again. He said that there's just one thing. He said the principal keeper that's there now, was, and it was this particular chap, he said, you don't have to go, but would you be okay with going? I said, yeah. And sure enough, we oh. ended up going out for a drink together, you know. Wow. <laughs> that yeah. was the end of to that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good story. I guess uh, people can, can change for the better. That's, that's yeah, good yeah. to hear. Yeah, and uh, but it's a shame you had to transfer there because uh, you said most of the, the guys were great at, at the smalls. Uh, yeah. Going back to that, how many keepers were uh, typically assigned to the smalls? What, what kind of rotation did you have there? There was only three in a crew. We the principal keeper and two assistant keepers. The reason that they made them uh, three on a, on, a, on a crew, it was actually on the smalls light. It was way back in the 1800s when there were only two keepers. One of the keepers died. The other one, fearing he'd be blamed for killing him, kept his body there, um, first inside, then he had to put it put it outside. The weather was bad. They didn't have no radio communication back then, bearing in mind either. So we had to wait till the relief boat come to get him off. By the time the relief boat come, because he'd been delayed due to bad weather, this guy had gone insane. After that, they decided to put uh, three keepers on the station. There's mm-hmm. been several plays and about this particular story. Um, yeah, I remember watching one on TV. It was quite good. It was quite yeah. good. Yeah, I think it inspired a couple of movies as well. Yeah, including the recent movie The Lighthouse, which the plot was very different. But uh, I read that the writer director was inspired by that that incident. And I was going to ask you about that. When you were there at the Smalls, was that something you and the other keepers knew about? Uh, was that Did that enter your thinking at all when you were there? No, it didn't really enter our thoughts. It, as I say, we, we had such a good rapport with each other. There, there was no worries. It, there, as I say, it was great camaraderie amongst the majority. You know, mm-hmm. you had the oddball, that, as, as you do anywhere. You know. Sure, yeah. Uh, so it's a, obviously a very isolated place. Do you recall any specific times in storms or especially high seas uh, at the Smalls? Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've, I've experienced a wave actually coming right over the top of the tower. Which and is how tall? So 120 feet. The tower would actually shake when that would hit. But it had to have that give. That's how it was designed. Because if it didn't, it would snap. That we built into it. Amazing feats of engineering. Absolutely. Yes. The water would wash down away and the light that would come back through the windows. Wow. <laughs> but uh, it was quite an experience. And that happened at the uh, longships as well, off Land's End. What were the living quarters like in those, in those towers? Quite cramped. You only had one bedroom for all three of you. Of course, there was always one on watch, you know, so there was only two in the, turned in at maximum. The middle watch was um, midnight till four in the morning. So that's when you do your ablutions. You didn't have a shower or anything. It was just a, a wash at the sink uh, in the kitchen. You didn't realise at the time when you were there, but it wasn't until you got ashore. People, you could smell it on your clothes, the diesel engine oil. <laughs> it was a great job, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. It was the best job I ever had, to be honest. 
your water supply at those places was uh, a cistern in the, the bottom of the tower, right? And how, was that delivered to you or how did that work? Yeah, that, that was delivered by the tenders, one of our ships. But, mm -hmm. um, we had tanks down on the rock, all the tanks. It supplied water as well. That was once a month. Those uh, oil tanks must have been pretty uh, heavy duty to withstand those, those uh, oh, seas sure. there. Well, the helicopter used to land on top of the oil tank because it was only, the only flat bit. So the smalls, you always had to keep an eye open for a, a wrong wave coming. Mm -hmm. And the ones when he had to take off in a hurry, he said, I'll have to go. He took off. A wave came over. It, it washed one of the guy's suitcases into the, in between our, our rock and the next rock sort of thing. He jumped in the gut after it, so then I had to fish him out along with his suitcase. <laughs> I was going to say, it's a good thing that suitcases all it swept away. And it sounds yeah, like he was, yeah. he was pretty lucky to survive for sure. that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I know a, a lot of keepers, other people I've interviewed, like uh, Richard Cummins, who was a, a lighthouse keeper in Ireland for, for quite a while, talked about the, uh, the wildlife, uh, Ian Duff in Scotland also. Mm -hmm. what, what, was, uh, what kind of wildlife did you have? Was there anything of significance around someplace like the Smalls? Well, we had a colony of seals there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to come swimming into the gut and pop their heads up and be taking a look to what was going on, what we were doing, you know. Mm -hmm. So they, they were quite comical and it was always interesting to watch those. Yeah. And the, the different seabirds as well, seeing the gannets dive and that sort of thing. A mm -hmm. lot of keepers actually became um, bird watchers and just to hear the sound of the gulls and the waves washing on the rock out there, you know, it was just. I'd probably go to sleep with those those sounds, right? <laughs> I remember spending a night at uh, Boston Light in Boston Harbor. I got to sleep on the couch in the keeper's house, and I was so aware of the gulls all night. They were so loud just outside the house. But I, I guess you get used to that probably fairly fast. But uh, oh well, was, yeah. yeah. When you consider, you have to get used to the loud, much louder fog signal going. Huh, right. Well, let's talk about a little bit about the fog signal uh, at the smalls. Uh, what what type of s signal was that? It was diaphone, same as on the light chips. It was really loud, a bit of like a grunt at the end sort of thing. You just got used to it. You you got to sleep, no problem. You know, it's funny because sometimes if it suddenly stops and it was just silent, you might wake up with the silence. That would we I've heard that before. It's the silence that, that woke you up. I heard a diaphone horn at Souter oh, that they still operate on occasion. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's it's pretty impressive. And I yeah. can't imagine <laughs> living inside a tower where you had a had one of those. Was it, it was it difficult to operate? Of course, it was uh, compressed air, right? And uh, probably not all that hard to, to start up. Is that right? Yeah, you had a much bigger engine you had to start up. Mm -hmm. And then um, let it build up to a certain pressure, then wind it in and uh, away you'd go. Some of them were crank start, they had to turn the handle. You ended up putting push button start on them. So after the smalls, you, you as you mentioned before, you moved to the inner dowsing light for reasons you, you mentioned before, and you actually spent seven years there. It's, uh, it's an unusual place. It's a, I don't know if you could exactly call it a lighthouse, certainly a light station. Certainly not anybody's idea of a traditional lighthouse. But first of all, can, for people who don't know, can you explain where the inner dowsing is geographically? Yeah, geographically, it's just off the wash off the east coast of England. It's off the Lincolnshire coast. And it was actually an ex-coal rig. They actually used a light vessel lantern on the top of it. The helipad was on top as well, uh, on, the, on the other corner. Being an ex-rig, of course, it was a much bigger than the granite tower that had just been on the previous two years. They actually had flushing toilets, they had showers. There was a TV room as well as the kitchen. There was a, the dining area as well, a separate radio room and other rooms. The engine room was in the centre. Uh, you'd also a, um, a crane on there to operate when the boat came along with the tenders, although most of the, all the release were done by helicopter. Mm -hmm. But on their annual inspection, we'd have to winch them from the little motor launch that they'd come across in onto the deck, which was about 120 foot up. <laughs> in this country, we had a bunch of uh, towers that were uh, sometimes referred to as Texas towers, though kind of like oil rigs. 
that seemed very similar. I guess they, uh, as you said, it was a former coal rig, and I guess they would explore for undersea coal. Uh, that is correct. That was up off the northeast coast where this rig was being used. There used to be some miners' cottages next to the lighthouse at one time. I've certainly heard about a lot of keepers who had hobbies of one kind or another to pass the uh, the off hours when there wasn't uh, work they had to do. Or to, when they're keeping watch, certainly uh, hobbies probably helped you stay awake when you're keeping watch. But did you have any hobbies you used to pass the time? I did, yeah. One of the old um, masters off the light vessel taught me how to put ships in bubbles. So I got quite adept at doing those. I only did them on, on the light vessels for some reason. Well, I didn't, didn't carry it on when I transferred over to lighthouses. I used to do a lot of reading. I did a bit of photography as well, of course. I learned quite a lot out there, to be honest. <laughs> well, I, I bet. Like Those are good places to read, I would, I would say. Uh, I don't know if you know Richard Cummins, the former Irish keeper who makes amazing ships and bottles and other models and posts a lot of the pictures on his Facebook page. I don't know if that's something you're aware of. I saw the interview you did with him. Most keepers had hobbies. Um, mm -hmm. Some were artists. They were quite good, some of them. And some had various hobbies, like rug making. Um, mm -hmm. some, some even knitted. <laughs> I've heard that, yeah. Your last three years after the... Uh, the inner dowsing and the smalls and your lightship time. You spent uh, three years with Trinity House. I think you you alluded to this earlier, but you uh, traveled around to, to a bunch of different lighthouses. And I believe you, you mentioned a couple earlier, but w during that period, were there uh, kind of favorite places you had? I think Albany was my favorite and in the Channel Islands. I did a couple of the other Channel Island art lights as well, uh, Caskets and Anwar, but Albany was on, on the island itself in Albany, of course, but so you got to meet all the local people, which was great because you were immediately, being a lighthouse keeper, wherever you went to in the country, you were immediately made welcome by the local community as one of them. You were there to protect their fishermen, their yachtsmen. That was a great, another great part of the job. And at Albany, the lighthouse was also the 999 call centre for the island. We were the only place manned 24 7. Mm -hmm. So we used to turn out the fireplace or ambulance. So the, the local Bobby you, copper used to call in on his rounds, call in for a chat at the lighthouse, have a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. it was it was great. What exactly led to the end of your career with Trinity House? The automation program, sadly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we could see the writing on the wall as, as long as, as soon as the computer chip came along, you know. How do you feel about lighthouse automation? Well, being a keeper, I'd... <laughs> I'd have to say, you know, it, I, I mean, we can see progress. You know, we know why it's going out, GPS and all that. But it's like one skipper said to us, he said, GPS is all very well. He said, but it tells me where I think I am. He said, when I see a lighthouse, I know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Things are changing all the time, aren't they? You know? Sure are. I guess it's progress, but you often lose things along the way with uh, so-called yeah. progress. Yeah. yeah. It's thing was, I mean, the other service keepers give, of course, is you were on hand in real emergencies, you know, whether it be a yacht in distress or in a couple of cases where climbers were stuck on the rocks where there was a lighthouse. One of our keepers, um, Gordon Medley, got, he actually ended up getting a medal for bravery. He, he rescued, he ended up doing two rescues on the cliffs at South Stack mm. lighthouse. And he, he actually went down and kept the bloke's head up out of the water while, while help came. Well, that's why uh, in Canada, they still have uh, more than 50 staffed lighthouses. Uh, even though the lights are automated, they like having the people there to keep an eye on things. Well, yeah. the government keeps threatening to, to take the keepers off, but there's enough outcry to keep them there, at least so far. Yeah, that's good. That's good to hear. Another thing that's been done over here, of course, they've got rid of all our coast guards. Most of our coast guard stations have gone. So there's no eyes there either. You have volunteer life savers. Life savers. There right? is mm -hmm. a coast watch and a volunteer group sprang up. It's not as heavy on the ground as what the old, the old coast guards were. You know, the, the fewer and far far between sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, at least it's something. You know, but um, they're just volunteers. Yeah. So I want to talk a bit about the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, but I'm also wondering, since you left Trinity House in 1988, 
and started the ALK uh, around that time. What else have you been doing in the years since then? I ended up moving down to London from, I was living in Suffolk at the time. Shortly after I did leave, before I moved down to London, Strange Church contacted me and asked me if I'd consider being an attendant for Southwall Lighthouse. That's just a part-time job. You just have to go along there every so often, keep it tidy and clean and show anybody around if, if, if it was requested. So I did that for two years um, after I came out of the service. But then I had to move down to London to go for full-time work. And I uh, actually went into security at the Press Association in Fleet Street in London. From there, um, I was transferred to Howard Jones registered office in the city of London, uh, where I did security. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I ended up getting a job in facilities at Howard Jones, at that registered office. So I ended up looking after all the staff there and um, kept them all supplied with uh, their um, office requirements. Mm. Um, but it was a, it was a really good little friendly crowd there. Yeah, uh, I was I was I was there nine years in total. But then um, redundancy came along again. He said, "We'll retrain you to do whatever job you fancy doing." And I took him up on it. So I retrained as a housing officer. I did the course, got the certificate, and I ended up getting the job as a housing officer. So that was quite interesting. It was only for two years because redundancy came along again and. After that, I ended up running a dry cleaners. And then from that, I ended up being manager of a coffee shop and gift shop. And then the big recession came along. In the last six years of my working life, uh, I was actually a carer. Say that again, you were? A carer. carer, looking after old people. Oh, right, okay. I thought that's what you said at first, yeah. But it was uh, quite an interesting, challenging job, you know. Sure. It was worthwhile doing. I bet, yeah. So what led you to start the Association of Lighthouse Keepers in 1988? Like I said, the, the camaraderie in the job had been great. It wasn't a job I wanted to just walk away from and forget about. I mean, right from the start, we collecting our own archives as well. Schools come to us, colleges for information. We had one girl doing a dissertation on fog signals. At first, of course, it was just from people within the service. When I left, there were only 174 keepers left at the time when I left. But there were also people in the Trinity House depots joined. Uh, we had our own mechanics and electricians back then as well. Some mm -hmm. of them joined. Even people at headquarters, uh, a couple of them joined. But then we had such an interest shown by general members of the public that we decided to open membership to, to anyone interested in lighthouses. And to be honest, Jeremy, I think it's just as well we did because there's not many of those keepers left now at all. The bulk of the trustees now on the board is made up of enthusiasts. They do a great job, sterling job. And the good thing about it is, over the years, when we've run our lighthouse tours, you get the regular go tour goers going on these tours, and to see the smiles on the faces when they meet up with old friends again, that's been a huge bonus of it as well, you know. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned the, uh, the tours and the archives. I know that you also, the ALK also does a, a magazine, LAMP, which is a fantastic, a lot of uh, history in there. Uh, how often does that magazine come out? Quarterly. Quarterly, yeah. Yeah, so members, if you get a membership in the ALK, you, you get the magazine, right? Yeah. You get the magazine in your metal uh, lapel bag and a, and a pack. Back to the archives you mentioned, is that, uh, is that just for UK lighthouses or is it kind of worldwide? It's mostly UK ones. As you can imagine, because a lot of stuff has been sent in by um, UK members. But we do have odd bits from other places, yeah, around the world. Books as well from around the world. The ALK also runs a museum, right, in Hampshire? Is that is that correct? That's correct, yeah. It's, it's inside Hearst Castle. Mm. Hearst Castle itself is run by English Heritage. That's H-U-R-S-T, as opposed to, we have a property known as the Hearst Castle in, in California, William uh, Randolph Hearst, H-E-A-R-S-T, so. Yeah, yeah. it's H-E. And what so, is there again at the museum there? We've got various lamps on display, various various light, lighting equipment. We've got a mock-up of the Needles Kitchen in the museum mm -hmm. as well. And um, we also show, show um, maps of all the lights around the UK, and it also shows uh, people the refraction uh, of the lens we've got there uh, from the prisms. 
the small team we have down there, they're really dedicated and they they look to refresh things, you know, every so often. And they also look after the Trinity House room that's down there as well. So I've got a couple of final questions for you, and these are for bonus points, okay? What was the best thing about being a lighthouse keeper? The fact that you knew you, you, the job you were there to do, you know, you knew that you were there to save lives, irrespective of where those sailors come from, whether they came from America, India, China, wherever. You were there to save people's lives. And that, that was, you know, the real benefit of, of doing that job. And, and like I mentioned earlier, when you got sent to anywhere in the country, that you might have been new when you got there, you were soon bolted into the local community as one mm -hmm. of them. It was, it was a great experience, it really was. Well, I think I know the answer to this, this last question, but looking back, would you do it again? Yes. Didn't Everything. hesitate there. For sure. Well, uh, Neil Hargreaves, it's really uh, fun talking to you. And I know we just have scratched the surface today. And uh, maybe we need to do a part two, part three, or, or whatever in the future. But uh, I, I'm sure there's a lot more stories we haven't covered today. And uh, I'd like to talk more about the ALK at some point, too. Uh, but I do really appreciate you spending this time with me today. It's really, really great talking with you. Thank you, Neil. You're welcome. And thank you for inviting me along, Jeremy. Again, to learn more about the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, go online to alk.org.uk. And as we mentioned earlier, in case anyone has trouble understanding any of what was said in the interview because of technical issues, you can read the transcript online on the USLHS News blog at news.uslhs.org. My thanks again to Neil Hargreaves. Now we're going to introduce something completely new on Lighthearted. Michelle, please help me describe what this new feature is all about. Sure, Jeremy. Lighthouses are seen around the world as a symbol of hope, guidance, and strength, along with lots of other positive qualities. The playwright George Bernard Shaw once wrote, and I quote, I can think of no other edifice constructed by man as altruistic as a lighthouse. They are built only to serve, end quote. In recognition of that, we plan to do occasional segments we're calling Be a Lighthouse. We'll be discussing people and organizations who are being lighthouses or beacons of hope in our communities. For our first Be a Lighthouse segment, we're going to be discussing a nonprofit organization here on the New Hampshire seacoast. For 200 years, the organization, now known as Gather, has been serving seacoast residents. Gather serves those in the community experiencing hunger by providing nutritious food through innovative distribution programs and a pantry market. The organization also collaborates with community partners to address the root causes of hunger throughout the seacoast in New Hampshire and Maine. Seneca Adam Bernard is the Associate Executive Director of Gather, which is based on West Road in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Michelle, you joined me for this interview and we have some personal experience with Gather. For a couple of years pre-pandemic, we asked visitors to our open houses at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse to bring food items. We passed those donations along to Gather, and over the course of a couple of years, we were very happy to donate quite a bit thanks to our visitors and volunteers. So let's listen to our conversation with Seneca Adam Bernard now. We're speaking this afternoon with Seneca Adam Bernard, who is the Associate Executive Director of Gather here in uh, Portsmouth. And we're gonna talk about what that organization is and does. And joining me for this interview is co-host Michelle Shaw. So Seneca, what is your role with Gather? Currently, I am the Associate Executive Director. Deb Anthony is our Executive Director. And so I work with her in order to make sure that all that Gather does gets done. I started as a volunteer about five years ago and have worked through the organization to my current position. Oh, that's great. And uh, I was reading about it, the organization that's now known as Gather has a really long and interesting history. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, about how it got started. Yeah, so Gather's current name is Gather, obviously. Gather for a hunger-free community, if we need to explain what Gather is. Uh, we changed our name back in 2017. We were called 
Seacoast Family Food Pantry for about a dozen years, but her origination starts back in 1816 uh, by a group of women in Strawberry Bank serving the families of fishermen. So we've had more than 200 here, years here in Portsmouth and a few different iterations, a few different locations that we've been in, but now we're on West Road in Portsmouth. What is Gather's mission and how wide is an area of an area do you guys serve? Our mission is pretty simple, to end hunger in the greater seacoast. Uh, we have a variety of ways that we do that through our pantry market, through mobile markets where we go out into different communities and set up a free farmer's market, uh, through cooking for community, which is a similar to a soup kitchen, only we make the meals, put them into go containers and serve them in the different variety of ways that we serve people uh, through our services. Our catchment area is anyone who can come to gather or anyone who can come to any of our markets. Every month we serve people from more than 50 towns in our pantry market in Portsmouth alone. So those are communities in Massachusetts, across the greater seacoast of New Hampshire, some of the communities in Maine. And we with our mobile markets stretch from the Summersworth Rochester area down to Seabrook, all the towns in between kind of, and then we do a distribution in Kittery, Maine as well. Wow, that's great. This may be a really stupid question, but I, I thought it might be interesting to ask you, what, why is it important that we eliminate hunger? There's only a couple of basic needs in life uh, to be able to eat, to be able to breathe, to be able to have shelter. And you can't function with most of the rest of your life on a hungry stomach. We see that with kids. We see that with seniors, any of the different populations that we serve. We see that with you know, I'm middle-aged, with middle-aged individuals as well. There's no reason that anyone should go hunger. There is plenty of food. It's just a matter of, can we get it to the people who need it instead of throwing it out? So Gather does that in a variety of ways. We work with 15 different grocery stores across the greater seacoast where we pick up food that would have otherwise gone to waste and serve that out. That's part of the Fresh Rescue Program through the New Hampshire Food Bank. Uh, we do gleaning, which is where we go out and we rescue food from farms directly in Rockingham, Stratford, and York counties. And we, the farmers will invite us out and either have already picked the food and handed off to us, or we go out to the fields and pick it ourselves. Rather than having it rototilled in or given to animals or just composted, we can rescue that food and give it to people in need. So there's a variety of ways that we can get the food and everyone should have access to it. That's our, our idea. Great. Um, I know you mentioned this just a minute ago, but what is the pantry market? The pantry market is, we hope it looks like a regular grocery store like Hannaford or Shaw's or any of them, Whole Foods. We know that it looks a little bit more like a store 24 or a small convenience store. You come in, you get to shop once a month for regular groceries. You get a shopping cart when you come in and you just go grocery shopping. There is meat, uh, milk and eggs. There is fresh produce. There are of course dry goods. There's personal care. But you get to come in, you go grocery shopping for what you and your family will eat, and then you take it home. It's pretty much as simple as that. I've seen the pantry market when I was there. It's pretty impressive. It's great. Yeah, I've never been. Yeah. Oh, you need to, to take a look. I'll have there to go check it out. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other programs uh, that Gather offers that you'd really like the public to know about? We have a very large number of programs that we do. We There's not just one way to end hunger. So our pantry market and our mobile markets are definitely one of them. Our Meals for Kids program, when there is no school, in theory, then there are no breakfasts and lunches for kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch. We don't believe in qualifying for anything. Showing up qualifies you. So we go out and we set up a farmer's market style the three weeks before school vacations. So in December, February, April, and then 11 weeks all summer, we go out week after week into up to 10 different locations. And we set up the farmer's market so that kids or families with kids can come out and get all the food that they would need that they normally would not have access to during those periods. We give out recipes. We work with a fantastic nutritionist uh, here in the greater Seacoast. She's a great, she's a volunteer of ours. And she makes up recipes for us that are either kid friendly or food specific, something that we're trying to promote. Our cooking for community program, which I mentioned briefly about making those to-go meals. They also will do up some samples for us each week so that if we decide to bring out something unique like kohlrabi that people might not be comfortable with, they'll give us uh, a recipe to go along with it, a sample so that people can take it, try it, see how it is and do it themselves. We have the gleaning program, which is that going to farms and rescuing the food, which is fantastic. We have a couple of other partnerships. So we currently partner with the University of New Hampshire. Uh, they have an old teaching kitchen over at Barton Hall on the university and we take extra food that was not served at the dining halls 
and turn that into to-go meals as well. We also bring over additional food. We work with UNH and uh, obtaining volunteers for that program. We make several hundred meals there every week as well. Uh, if you can think of it ending hunger, and we haven't thought about it, we want to know about it. Uh, but otherwise, there's usually something for everyone. We have a senior program. We believe in, in trying to hit every demographic that we can. We also are very lucky to work with a huge diversity of people. And so in Summersworth, there is Little Indonesia. It's the first Little Indonesia in the world. Uh, it's called Indonesian Community Connect. And we work with them so that every other week there is a culturally respectable food pantry for those individuals. So I would eat white or brown rice in the Indonesian community, they eat jasmine rice. So we make sure we source jasmine rice and have it available at that market. So we, we do try to pay attention to vegan or vegetarian, mm -hmm. uh, gluten-free, dairy-free, and in some cases, very specific markets designed to cater to the dietary needs of some individuals. That's right. fantastic. So how large is the staff at Gather and how many volunteers do you have? Uh, only a few years ago, there were six of us. There are now about 20 staff members, full and part-time. Uh, and we utilize more than 200 different volunteers every single month. Wow. In our database, there's more than 1,000 volunteers that help us get going, but not every one of them come in every single month. And some of them uh, do the same task week after week for us. So it takes a lot of people to pick up at all those grocery stores. There is a team of volunteers that go out and do that with our trucks for us. They come in week after week, the same shift. Same with our pantry market or the mobile markets. Everyone finds something typically that they really like doing and they will help us out with it. I like to balance between the different programs. So I might be in the pantry market today and I might be out at a mobile market tomorrow or I might be in the kitchen. I think that there's a large variety for volunteers who wanna get involved here on the Seacoast. Uh, if you are interested in ending hunger, then there's, there's plenty of opportunity to do it. By the way, my uh, my wife is uh, talking about volunteering from you, so, for you, so you might be hearing from her <laughs> in the not too distant future. Uh, I think there's a good chance of that. So, if people uh, here uh, in the the greater New Hampshire Seacoast region are interested in volunteering for Gather, how, how would they go about that? Well, you can certainly check out our website, gathernh.org, and uh, there is a volunteer section there. We'll go over some of the different opportunities we have. To become a volunteer, there's also the sign up there, or you can email volunteer at gathernh.org and we'll get back to you. Uh, but once you are a volunteer with ours, us, once you've signed up for Better Impact, which is the service that we use to manage that, then all the different variety of opportunities that you qualify for can go there. So we don't just hand off the keys to a truck to anyone. We do do a background check uh, on things like that to make sure that all of society is safe. Uh, we don't just let anyone in the kitchens. They don't let me in the kitchen sometimes. So you do, there is sometimes some qualification to do. And when you become a volunteer with Gather, all those opportunities open up. We also do many events throughout the year. So some of the big ones are fill the hall with the music hall in Portsmouth the last Saturday in June. They try to fill every seat in the music hall with a bag of food, specifically for our Meals for Kids program. It takes literally hundreds of volunteers to make that happen. So whether you're doing a food drive in your neighborhood or you are day of uh, trying to collect all that food out of people's cars and move it into the hall, or you are working afterwards and sorting it, it takes a bunch of volunteers to do any one thing that Gather does. So we're always looking for volunteers and always welcoming new people into the Gather family. How has the pandemic affected what you guys do? The pandemic has been uh, a massive challenge and also a great blessing because I'll start with the blessing. It really brought hunger to the forefront of people's mind. I think previous to the pandemic, some people knew that we had hunger here in the greater Seacoast, even though we are more affluent than many parts of the country. But really the pandemic brought forth that it happens everywhere. It does not matter where you live, there are hungry people. Your neighbor can be hungry, even though they have a big house. So, so that has been a, a good benefit of the pandemic. The challenges for Gather has been, people haven't wanted to go inside. If we remember back in March and April of 2020, that was very difficult. People really didn't want to go inside. Uh, the number of people that were newly hungry or had never experienced needing help uh, rose quite a bit back in 2020. And so us getting creative with new ways. So doing the markets outside across the greater seacoast, doing more of the markets, uh, getting tents and sometimes circus tents to do what we do, uh, getting extra vehicles to make it happen and going and serving where people live and work uh, really were some of the big challenges. As we've worked through the pandemic, 
much of that challenge has been eased up. We, we are much better at it than we were when it was a surprise. Uh, but it doesn't mean the need has gone away and it hasn't really necessarily meant that there are more hungry people than there were back in 2019. It really means that hungry people now know some of the services that they can go get. And with Gather's choice model, where you are choosing what you want, we will not just hand you a box. We won't just hand you a bag and say, this is what you get. We really do set it up so that you get to choose what you want. That model really has been welcomed by so many of the members who see us because if they want eggplant this week, then they can get eggplant. And if they don't need eggplant, they're not going to take it. So we see a reduction of waste in the choice model. And a, it's a little bit more dignity, a little bit more enjoyable that you're going just like you go to a grocery store and getting the food that you actually want. I have kind of an unusual question for you. Uh, I think our listeners who are, of course, pretty much lighthouse buffs, people know that one of the parts of the appeal of lighthouses is that they are uh, a symbol of hope. I think it's a big part of their appeal. Uh, this segment uh, that we're, we're uh, doing right this minute is uh, as the first installation of a new segment we're calling Be a Lighthouse. And uh, I'm wondering if you might have any thoughts on that phrase. Do you see Gather as a lighthouse in the community? Gather is only as great as all the people that work with us. And that's why our name really is Gather. We gather the community together to serve those who might need it. We gather in a kitchen to make meals. We gather around a table to eat those meals. So I would not consider gather, I would not consider gather a lighthouse, but I instead uh -huh. consider all of what I would call ambassadors, all the people who make what we do uh, easy and worth it and really helping it. So every volunteer to me would be a lighthouse. They're not just serving in the two hours that they're working with us. In truth, yeah. once you become part of the gather family, you're out sharing what we do. You're bringing in other people who might be able to donate other people who might be able to volunteer or other people who need our services. We mm -hmm. have found out that more than 50% of the people who utilize our services find out from someone else who utilizes our service. In any normal business, that would be fantastic. Like word of mouth advertising, you can't buy that. It is fantastic. And so we love it. So yeah. uh, to answer your question, I think <laughs> others would probably consider Gather a Lighthouse, but really we are the water and everyone huh. is the lighthouse. Well, I love that answer. I love that. And, yeah. Yeah. It's really, you're like a network of lighthouses working together, which is uh, the way real lighthouses work too. So yes. when lighthouse doesn't work in isolation, so that's a, an excellent answer. Gather doesn't believe that we need to serve every person who is hungry, but we do believe every person who is hungry needs to be served. So uh, going with what you just said, Gather works with the Seacoast Food Provider Network, which was a program started by Gather but really is much bigger than Gather. There's about 60 different food providers across the Gator, Greater Seacoast, whether it is a food pantry or a soup kitchen or an after-school program, where we all network together and we provide the sources. So if someone needs flour, they can put out there that we need flour and the rest of us will get together and get them some flour. If I have too much oranges today, I can put out there that I have a bunch of oranges. Does anyone need any? and everyone else can work together to get them from us. We do that with physical items, but we also do that with intellectual property. So when the pandemic came and no one had uh, a document of how are we going to deal with this or what happens if someone comes down with COVID, uh, we worked together to create some protocols and then share them with everyone so that if you are only four or 10 people in an organization serving your community, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel everywhere. So. When you say that lighthouses work together, so do the food pantries. We all work together to serve everyone in need. That's great. What do you enjoy most about your work with Gather? I have the best job, I'll admit. Uh, so when I first came, I was a volunteer two hours a week, like most people. And I picked an afternoon shift in case I decided to require my next employer to let me uh, volunteer during those hours. It soon became that I was volunteering 40 hours a week. Some of that really was, I love sorting food. So we get in food drives or food donations. It has to be sorted in our pantry market. It should be very much like a grocery store. So you won't find outdated food in our pantry market. You won't find dented cans in our pantry market. And so all that has to be sorted. We do provide that in other markets, in the mobile market, et cetera, but not in our uh, pantry itself. So I love sorting food. A lot of that isn't just the excitement of like, what is in this box, but also you get to work very closely with the different volunteers. And so you're doing work, but you really are socializing and finding out that 
one of the people that you're working with is an airline pilot, a different one is a doctor, and there is a homeless individual who is working with you as well. And so it really brings a huge variety of people together to do the same thing. I love that. I also, in my current position, get to go out and kind of be the community liaison. So I get to work with other places that might have resources that we can utilize. So whether it be the National Guard, who's letting us use the armory right now for our Friday markets, so that we're inside instead of outside freezing in a tennis court, or uh, Rochester Child Care Center, who we get to work with. I get to work with both those who give, uh, have services and can give them out or who need our services. So uh, Rochester Child Care is one of those where we drop some food and they, they do a distribution for us. I, I really do get to have the best part of everyone. I see everyone at their best at all times and I'm very, very lucky. That's great. So I have one final question for you, Seneca. Uh, you've uh, certainly covered this to some extent already, but if somebody contacts you and says, how can I help? Do you have any recommendations? Are, are you looking currently more for food donations, for monetary donations, or both equally? Or uh, how would you, what would you tell them? I always go with who is the person, what is the demographic that is trying to donate to us? So if you are someone with a child, then we recommend getting us items. So that might be food, it might be personal care. You can't get personal care typically in most food pantries and there really is nowhere else. You can't use your EBT for personal care. So anything from shampoo to deodorant, toothpaste, dish soap, any of that. Uh, so we encourage schools, for example, to really work on doing food drives for us because it, it is very easy for younger people to understand I am giving an item. For not younger people, <laughs> then we encourage monetary donations. It, really allows Gather to purchase what we need when we need. So we're not paying for storage. We're not paying staff or requiring a bunch of volunteers to try to sort through uh, food. And typically we can purchase at a much better rate than uh, the average consumer. We get discounts of 40% or more at many locations. Sometimes we get lots of free items. So when we offer to pay for something, then we'll get it uh, reduced. And we try to buy local whenever possible. So for example, our milk comes from Kentucky Creamery out of Kentucky, New Hampshire, but we get a huge discount on it because they really like what we do. If you tried to buy the milk for us, you'd pay almost three times what I pay for that same thing. Uh, we always are in need of volunteers. Some of, the, some of the jobs just require or have more turnover. Thursday nights seem to often be an a issue for us. Not everyone wants to work on a Thursday afternoon or there are things coming up. And honestly, I would ask all donors anytime, if you're going to give money or items, to really consider the season that you're giving in. Uh, food pantries, many, many nonprofits, we get a lot of donations in November, December. People, people think of us then. There's Thanksgiving. Everyone's hungry at Thanksgiving. There's, there are the other holidays in December. But what we don't see is people coming out of the woodwork in February and March when it's really cold out, when we do need volunteers because some of our other volunteers have left to go to Florida, for example. Or we do need to replenish food in the pantry because there was a lot back in December, but no one is donating in February or March. Uh, so I am always for, let's talk about what makes sense for you, but I will always also guide you towards some of our more needed items. So the personal care, uh, monetary donations so we can buy meat locally or vegetables locally. I hope that answers your question. Oh, absolutely. And I know as far as uh, items, the type of items you're looking for, there are some guidelines on the website as, as well that help people with that, right? Exactly. We update the website typically quarterly or right before any of the big events uh, to make sure that it is updated with what we actually need in the pantry at that mm -hmm. moment uh, so that it can guide people as to what we need versus just whatever they saw. Yeah. And the website again is? GatherNH.org. GatherNH.org. Well, Seneca Adam Bernard, I want to thank you so much for being our guest on our first Be a Lighthouse segment on our lighthearted podcast. It's a pleasure talking with you. And I, whatever it was, three, four years ago, maybe even a little more than that, when I first contacted you and we started taking some donations at our open houses at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, and I got to visit and see firsthand what you guys are doing, I was extremely impressed. And that's why I've asked you to be here uh, with us today. And I wish you continued success. And I just want to use this uh, opportunity to encourage people listening who might be involved with other lighthouse organizations to consider doing things like this in their areas, because obviously there are similar organizations all around the U.S. 
uh, food banks and uh, nonprofits uh, that do similar work. If people could ask uh, their visitors to bring an item uh, that uh, fits in with what these places are looking for, uh, it adds up to a lot. So uh, just a suggestion to people out there. So again, thank you so much, Seneca, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy and Michelle, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank that. you. And thank you for all that you do for the communities. To learn more about Gather and the organization's mission to end hunger in the Seacoast, New Hampshire area, visit gathernh.org. We'll be doing these Be a Lighthouse segments occasionally. The subjects could be any organization anywhere that helps make people's lives better in some way, or the subject could be a simple act of kindness by an individual. I'd like to throw this out to our listeners. If you have any ideas for these Be a Lighthouse segments, please let me know by emailing me at jeremy at uslhs.org. Lighthouses are more than interesting structures. I really believe their status as icons representing everything good about humanity makes them special and is a big part of their appeal. Do you agree, Michelle? I absolutely 100% agree with that statement, Jeremy, wholeheartedly. So thanks as always to all the volunteers, members, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about the tours and all the other things the society does. And don't forget to visit the society on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you listen to this podcast on a platform that allows you to post reviews, please rate and review us. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Shine.